Um, well, first, I want to take a moment and further the commercial on um, the um, spaghetti dinners Saturday. Um, we have been trying to start more, involving our youth more in the outreach programs in this church and doing things and reaching out there to the community. And this Saturday, we're going to be doing sort of our first real part of that with uh, Brother John and I are going to try to take some of our kids out and help deliver some of the spaghetti. You know, he usually takes a lot of orders. And they were also going to use that opportunity to um, hand out flyers for the revival. Now, I'll bring this up now for a reason. I don't know if any of you actually have the ability to do like Brother John does and take orders or not. And that takes a little bit of logistics and planning and salesmanship. But if, you can, if any of you feel led to do that, we would be glad to deliver pizzas within a reasonable distance. Pizzas. Spaghetti. I'm thinking pizza. Spaghetti within the reasonable distance. We're talking like Callahan, Densmore. 295. We can't go too much farther than that because then you run into problems with it getting hot. You know, we want to get it to them still in good shape. So if you wouldn't mind, if anybody feels led to do that, get with Miss Billy or me and we'll figure it out. Amen. All right. Tonight I want to talk to you all a little bit about somebody in the Bible who kind of reminds me of me. And, uh, and not in a good way. <laughs> ah, no, not Samson. <laughs> I wish it was Samson. That would be kind of cool, but... No, we're going to talk about Jacob. Um, Jacob. You know, Jacob, we, we, many times I, I've heard Brother, um, Brother Turberville pr- preach on him as the trickster, yeah. as the joker. But he was the good child, really, <laughs> compared to Esau. Esau, I, I had not noticed this before, but Esau did something that his parents didn't like at all. He took two wives of the Hittites. He also... You can see in his re- reactions to, even though Jacob tricked him, he hated his brother. He had that in his heart. Esau, and later in the, in the New Testament somewhere, it says, Esau whom I've hated, Jacob whom I've loved. And it's talking about God actually talking to Sarah. And Esau wasn't a good character. Um, Jacob was kind of the good, good guy. And that he did what God and what his daddy told him to do when he was told to go to the far land. He, he, he's leaving his, now I want you all to picture this for a minute. He's leaving his house, leaving his family, going somewhere else that we was sent to Laban to get a wife. And he ends up staying there, I think it was right at uh, 20 years. He's just leaving his home for the first time, you know, that we, can, that we have record of here. He'd already had, on the trip out to Laban's home, he had the dream of the angels coming up and down the ladder when God spoke to him. So we know in that part, God's already spoke to him. He is a child of God. He's already got a relationship with God, right? Come on. He's already got a relationship with God. He's going to a foreign land. Yes, he's still the ja- Jacob that Brother Doug commented about, the trickster that he's using his wit, his intellect, and he's relying on that in his life, but he's had a relationship with God. We sit there and we go from there, and I wanted to bring in, we're going to start, the description tonight is going to be Genesis 32. And we're going to do the whole chapter. But um, I kind of wanted to get you all to think about it. He's also a man of ambition. He had ambition in his life. He, he, he stole the birthright. He stole the blessing. So he had some ambition. He had some passion and some drive in his life. He had some drive. He ended, you know, as you all know, he ended up being the husband of four wives and 11 kids. He better have some drive. Uh-oh. You know, He better have some drive. He um, just, I, I kind of want you to get your head wrapped around who he is in an emotional standpoint and how he was. That man of strong will and drive, he had, when he came out of Laban's um, household, he had, it says he had 11 children already. He already had 11 children, and that's 20 years. Now, yeah, he had four wives to work with that, but he had 11 children. So let's start with, oh, I had a little, little note verse here. <laughs> he, he lived up to this. Colossians 3, 23, 25, you ain't got to go there, Brother Gary, but it says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. I kind of think he lived up to that. He did it with all his heart. So let's start with Genesis 32, one through, um, the whole chapter, 1 through 32. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. 
And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob, saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saith unto me, Return into thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. <clears throat> For with thy staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau. I am tending my brother from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou sayest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the seed of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. And he lodged, cannot be numbered for the multitude. And he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau his brother. Two hundred she-goats and twenty he-goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, thirty milk camels with their colts and forty kine, and ten bulls, twenty she-asses and ten foals. And he delivered them into the hand of the servants, every drove by themselves, and sent unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space betwixt drove and drove. And he commanded a foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee, and askest thee, saying, Who art thou, and whither thou goest, and whither goest thou, and whose are these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. And, he, and so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall ye speak unto Esau, when ye find him. And say ye moreover, moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me. And afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept of me. So went the present over before him and lodged, and himself lodged that night in the company. And this is kind of the, the next part here where we get up to where I really wanted to go. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford of Jebok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and, as, and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost, a, dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. And therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrink, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrink. I kind of wanted to, to read this first because many times, how many of y'all are going through a trial right now, through a trouble right now? Amen. The main part that we're going to concentrate on tonight is that part where Jacob wrestled with the angel. And that, if you look at the, these scriptures, it's right in the middle of the worst part of the worst night of Jacob's life. He has already come to the point here where he's already sent the five droves ahead of him. We're gonna we're gonna go through that real quick. Jacob saw the. I really wanted to point out. I'm sorry. I got to back up a half a second. Jacob saw the messengers and immediately knew that they were God's host, those angels. That was one thing that we I wanted to bring out because Jacob saw those messengers. 
he already had the voice of God talk to him. The voice of God spoke to him and told him to leave Laban's house. He recognized it instantly. When he saw those angels come, he recognized what they were, who they were. He knew God's voice. He knew God's presence. I, I bring that up because when we get into the part about the, um, the wrestling with the angel, many people want to say, what is this? Who is this man? Who is this? And there's a reason I wanted to bring that up. Give me just a second. I get my thoughts in the head going here. I wanted to go back to um, verse six. When the messengers had come back to Jacob after he went, they went out to Esau, and they tell him, and they tell him what what Esau coming at him with four hundred men. Jacob shows fear, extreme fear. Sure. And the first thing he does at that fear, yeah. what does he do? Does he cry out to God? No. He connives and starts figuring out what I can I do. And that's when he develops the droves. He fits, figures out that plan on the droves and he ends up sending 580 animals in five or six ways to appease Jacob, I mean, to appease Esau. To appease him, to make him, to, 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 to figure out of his own way to do it. And then only after that does he make this prayer that I reread. He says, after that, after the last resort, he's, here's, here's a child of God. How many of us do the same thing? We're sitting there through our life, and we're going, you know, something happens, and the first thing we do is Google it. Y'all yeah. Yeah, know me and my technology. I enjoy the, the computers and stuff like that. But that's the first thing many of us do. We'll Google it, or we'll find some other means of, of handling it on our own. We don't look to God first. I do it all the time. I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I know what I, I, I need to learn to lean on God the way this is telling me. This is why I said Jacob and I are similar. He went away 20 years away from his family. And God put him there for a reason. God put Jacob over there with Laban. He's a trickster. What was Laban? A bigger trickster. Jacob had to learn to do it and what it was like to be tricked. He had to learn. And, and, and Rachel... Ain't much better when she stole the idols from her daddy. There you go. Almost got Jacob in some big trouble there. Yeah. God puts us where we need to be to Come show on. us and train us and mold us and make us on, what He wants us out of us. He, under, right. he understands much better the big picture than we could ever dream of. Yeah. We wonder one sometimes why God puts us in a certain place in a certain time, and He goes, we just like, Lord, I don't know what you got for me here. He but He's got it. Hey, he I understands know. it. And that trust in Him is what we need to do. Amen. Amen. By leaning on His own will, on His own thoughts. You look at His life. He, he led on His own thoughts, or His mama, actually, when He stole the birthright. Uh -huh. His own, his, his, the same thing with the blessing. Sure. You sit there and you go through that and you see how He was trained, sort of, in His mama's, in his mama's lap. Mm -hmm. And then how, how, he, how He went through the process in Laban's house. Now, yeah, a lot of that was actually God telling him what to do. Yeah. But that was God's blessing on him. That was God showing him how to do it. And then he runs and leaves with God's Word, God teaching him and telling him when to run. And I'm sitting there going to myself, I said, how did he go from getting God's blessing on the, on the animals, coming out of that house with all that stuff, and then he's on the run, and the first thing he starts trying to do is figure out how to trickster again. How did he go from, one, living in, really in God's will, sort of, to being the trickster again on the, on the road? Come on. It's like he went from the high point, and which is kind of backwards, ain't it? When things are all good, is it, are we usually the ones where we, when it's good, we kind of trust ourselves, don't we? That's right. And then when it gets bad, we, God, help! Yeah. And he kind of did it backwards. Come on now. He was walking with God, and then when things got kind of scary, he kind of did it on his own. Or tried to. And that's where God had to straighten him out. Amen. What's that? Come on, for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I said he prayed, to the, he prayed that prayer as a last resort. And then after the prayer, it says he lodged there that same night. And that's where we're going to pick up sort of with the, with the wives. Um, first page is out of the way.
<laughs> yes, sir. And um, and he rose up that night. I want to go to verse 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the four Jabbat. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. So here, he'd already said that he stopped. And, and, then, and here in the middle of the night, at some point, he rises up and takes his family to a little safer spot. And in the dark of the night, we like said, on the, probably on the worst day of his life, some divine intervention occurs. Jacob, in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Mm-hmm. Alone. That's good, actually. Yep, that's a, that's a moment there. Kind of want to ask you, you know, that carnal man of yours doesn't want you to have a lone time with God. Come on now. That self, how hard is it for you to get a few minutes to read your Bible and study? How hard is it really, I mean really, so many things of this world distract and take time from us, and God had to bring him to a point right here and a place and time to get him alone. Had to scare him to death. Had to basically send everybody away to safety just to get him alone for a few minutes and get his attention. You know, if, if we don't make time for God, he'll make time for us. We're his children. He's going to get our attention somehow. And Jacob was left, was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Now, that prayer earlier, we didn't see an answer for that prayer right after the prayer, did we? We didn't see him pray that prayer and get an answer. But I believe this is his answer. How many of you ever heard to say, sometimes you pray and you get an answer you didn't ask for? This is his answer. Who was this man? And I kind of want to bring these two things out. Jacob himself tells us a little later in verse 30 who this man was. When he says that it was the... Um, yep. And he says, God face to face. I have seen God face to face. And then it also, as a reference, in Hosea 12:4, it says, And yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. Mm-hmm. So we know this was a, 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 divine, a, a being from heaven. Jacob himself says it's God, and he's got all the experience. I believe it was Jesus Christ pre-incarnate come wrestling with him himself. That's right. That's right. All right? So Jacob's wrestling with Jesus. He may not recognize it. I don't believe he recognized it right off the bat. But as the night pro- progressed, especially when he reached out and touched him and took his hip out of the point, that's when he knew. Right. So he's, I kind of want to get this picture for you for a minute. He's battling all night long with Jesus. God. Did, did Jacob go find him? God came to Jacob. Yes, he does. Jesus came to Jacob go, and tested him. Jesus came to Jacob and put him under pressure, put him under a trial, wanted to see how much he wanted it. He, Jacob was at a bottom and an end, end, end place, and he's got a hold of God. Every one of us in here as Christians, we've got a hold of God already. Are you going to hang on for the blessing? Are you going to hang on with determination and fire in your heart? When that bad time hits you? Are you going to hang on? Because the many people will say, you'll just let God let go. I'm telling you, grab on and, 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 and with a little boldness say, Lord, bless me. Lord, help me. God says that we are... We are, I got, I got these in here. The Spirit, in Romans 8, 13 through 17, I'm going to concentrate on verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be, that we may be also glorified together. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're Amen. Right there with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our brother. We're adopted. We can boldly come before that throne. It's, it's, it's part of our inheritance. Not something we earned, but through Him we have inheritance. 
Amen. And that's where we, what I'm getting at. Nothing we can do is bold to our own self. What's the difference in boldness and pride? They look a lot similar, don't they? You got a guy prideful, and you got somebody bold. But I'm bold, not in my own power, but in his power. Amen. And I'm prideful when I'm in my own power. Amen. There's a huge difference. Yes, you do it in pride, what's the Bible say? Pride goes before a fall. Oh, right. You're going to fall. Sure. I got two more verses on that same thing. John 10, 10 and 11. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. How do we get that inheritance but through Jesus Christ giving his life for us? And we got it. And he didn't give it just for us to live some fancy-pansy, you know, halfway life. Come on now. If you find yourself going through valley after valley after valley after valley and not able to stand up and give glory to God, there is a problem. Amen. We're going to go through valleys over and over again. My pastor and I were talking about the other day. It seems like each one of these... Young folks, young preachers that have come up and surrendered to God, it seems like the moment you surrender to God and try to do something for God, you get slapped. You get trampled. How about that? Amen. And guess what? Sure. It's a test. Like this right here we're talking about. It's a test. And every one of us, not just the young preachers, but every Christian goes through it. Amen. The moment you try to surrender to God and give God your life, yeah. there's going to be a trial. There's going to be tests. There's going to be trouble. Amen. It's not an easy time. It's a joyous time and not an easy time. You can claim joy. You can claim strength through Jesus Christ. You can claim power through Him. If you look to Him, if you see Him in His glory, all you got to do is just claim it. Amen. If you sit there and focus on the past, like we just talked about the carnal man wanting you to, to, to not spend time in the Word. If you focus on all the bad things and you don't look for the good things, you don't focus on the Bible and Jesus and, and the things that we know to do, You tend to look at the bad. I call it perspective. Your perspective changes. Amen. And just by simply doing one thing and looking in the right place. Everything changes. Everything changes. And that's all it takes is putting your eyes on God. Everything changes. If you can just keep your eyes on Him. It, I didn't plan this part, but as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, yep. even so must the Son of Man would be lifted right. up. Each one of those folks in that time in the wilderness when those snakes were coming through, all they had to do to get salvation was look up Amen. at that serpent, the brass serpent. That's right. It's simple. Come on, Why is it any different for us now? It's not. It's not. That's right. you got a sin besetting you that you don't Come seem on, like you can get rid of. Yep. How do you get rid of it? You look to Him. Amen. When that temptation comes... For whatever it is that's been kicking your behind, look to Him. Amen. It's that simple. It's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. That's right. And that's what He makes it. He makes it. It's on Him. He'll, right. he'll, he'll save you from it. He already has saved you from it. It's just up for you to claim it. <sighs> All right, we're going to go into verse 27. And the angel said unto him, no, and he said unto him, no, and the angel said unto him, and he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Jacob. Earlier in Jacob's life, when somebody asked him his name, it's his daddy, he said his name was Esau, didn't he? Yeah, yeah that's the last time that happened. And what does Jacob's name mean? Remember what Jacob's, mean, name, Jacob's name means, Brother Doug? Yeah. Supplanter, usurper, deceiver. This is a lot more than just in him asking his name. Oh, absolutely. Come on, brother. Amen. Absolutely. This is a moment for Jacob to confess. Because yes. by now, as we know, he already knows it's Jesus. Yeah, sure he does. And Jesus knows everything about him. That's right. And in his name is who he is. Oh, yeah. And it's his moment saying, yeah. I'm Jacob. Yeah. You know who I am in here. Yeah. That's his moment. And he said the truth. He said, I'm Jacob. Yes. He confessed. Amen. In this confession, you're going to see confession, and right after it, transformation. In this next chapter, as we go through the rest of this in the next chapter. And he said in tw verse 28, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. 
For as a prince that has power with God and with men right. and has prevailed. Same power we have. That's right. Amen. Same power we have through Jesus Christ. Amen. Not of our own self, but through Jesus Christ. But it takes, like Jacob did here, grabbing it and hanging on to it. Right. We had the truth. And if you can grab that truth and hang on to it, because the devil is a deceiver and a liar, and he's here to tell you you don't. I, I watch our teenagers battle all the time. Come on now. You know, they listen to the world and self-confidence and self-worth and all that. And it ain't about that. It's about worth in God, worth in Christ. They, believe, they, they buy into the self-confidence and positive thinking and all this stuff. And they get, you see them battling over and over again. They get no real victory because the next day, the next week, they're still battling with, oh, I ain't worth nothing. You see our, our, our young ladies sometimes go from, Different bad relationship to different bad relationship because they, they like they're punishing themselves. Yeah, come on now. And this is because the same principle. Come on. If they got their self worth and their value from God on, and not trying to, to to deceive value in a man, come on. And it's the same thing with for us guys. Come on now. We get our value from what, brother? From the Lord. But I mean, as guys in the carnal self, oh, yeah. we get value from our job. Yeah. From our beautiful family and home or whatever. And we start seeing. What did Jacob have when he came out of Laban's house? He had all the stuff. And he comes out of Laban's house and he's got all the stuff. And God had to take him to that point where it was all in jeopardy. So I might be gone the next day before he relied on God right here in this, in this part. He gave up self. He stopped relying on his self. He stopped relying on his intellect and his IQ. And he gave up. He said, all right, Lord. It's up to you. He goes, And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it thou dost ask after my name? Because Jacob already knew. And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And he passed over Peniel, and the sun rose upon him, and he hauled it upon his thigh. Yep. And therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched not the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. Does God got to break you to get your attention? He reached in Jacob's thigh and put him out of joint. Come on now. And he was, for the rest of his life, walking on a cane. There's, there's, there's a verse that says that Jacob worshipped when he... Um, went and he blessed um, Joseph's son leaning upon his staff. Right. And that's part of his life for the rest of his life. We have a, a history here of the people of Israel not eating of that part of the body anymore right. because of this permanent, yep. and, way, and even in this case because it is an iconic figure, right. way more than permanent because it has that lifetime and ec- decades and eons of history behind it. Right. Does God got to break you in some way like that? Does He got to break you to get you to that point? Seems like He does. It seems like He does for many of us. I know I reached a point about uh, a little bit more than ten years ago where I came to church here. God took me to a place where I did not know how anything was going to work out. I thought it was all about to go away. Family, I was ready to just walk off from it. I got out of church. As a Christian, you can do that, guys. It's possible. I got out of church, and I started trying to do things on my own. I put all my time in work and the family. I, I kind of made it a bad decision, a very bad decision, to get out of church so I could take care of, a, at the time, a very sick wife and still work my job and kind of have that you know, Sunday was my day that I needed, I needed time. I needed to be able to do something you know, around the house. I made all these excuses. And the wife wasn't going to church with me at the time either. Kind of similar to now in some ways. But it was a lot different from where I was as a person then. Because I wasn't seeking God at all. Not at that point. I, I'd talk to Him every now and then. It was kind of like, you know, on the, on, the, on the casual thing. But I wasn't depending upon Him like I needed to do. And he had to take me to a low place. He had to take me to a low place. I ended up one Sunday afternoon in the parking lot of a church with a man I didn't know 
for about four hours, and God brought that man to me because I walked into a strange church, heard the gospel preached, thank the Lord, came out of that church crying and convicted, and a guy came out there in the parking lot and started talking to me after church. His family left and went to lunch. And he stayed there with me till like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, crying and praying and talking. And I tell you what, if, there, if, if there's an angel in this world, it's probably him, but I know he's a real person, you know. But Amen. Lord bless me with his presence that day. Amen. That's what we're here for as Christians between each other. He didn't know me from anybody. I know him to this day. Every time I call him up and talk to him or anything, he's there. God. We don't talk that often now, but we did for many years there. But when God took me to that point, what did I have to do? Come on now. And that was the same thing that Jacob did here. Come on. I had to stop listening to me. I had to stop doing it my way. I had to stop thinking about me first. That's what God wants. Does He have to break you like that to get you to that point? No. Brothers and sisters, don't make Him get you to that point. You can surrender before you get there, before there's something like that happen sure. to you. Sure. You can. But don't let him take you to that point, to that low place. Amen. I got a I got a great thing here on you for you. I want to tell you how this story ends. Jacob in verse in chapter thirty three, chapter thirty three, verses one through four. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. Now, here he comes, y'all. Esau's coming with his 400 men. You got your everything scattered to the four winds, right? No. Nope. Wait, let's hear what happened. Let's hear what happened. Wait a minute. Didn't he have them hid across the creek? Wait a minute. And he divided the children into Leah and into Rachel and into the two handmaids, and he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them, but they, they hear. How about that? And bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came over, came near to his brother. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah. What happened to that conniving, scheming, yeah. prideful man? He humbled himself. Yeah. Amen. It's a huge part of life. It's a huge part of my Christian walk now. I'm having to learn every day to do this. Oh, what, how do you humble yourself? Can you? Can you humble yourself? Well, that's what he does. Amen. I'm just curious because it's a hard thing. Can I, can I, can deny, I can deny myself. I can pray that God allows me to be less and he be more. But can you really humble yourself? Or is that something he does? You know, because we, we know we need to be more humble. We know we don't need to be prideful. We know that's the right way to go. But can we really, truly humble ourselves? I can deny myself stuff. I can, I can not do things. I can make sacrifices for God and take things out of my life that are, you know, materialistic and maybe fasting or whatever else. But can I really humble myself? A good question. Here's the great part. Let's go to verse 4. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Amen. I don't know. We don't have Esau's part of this story. Something happened. Something happened. That's right. Because when it says when they parted, Esau is going to kill him. Esau was waiting for his daddy to pass and the grieving to get over and he was going to kill him. It was going to be done. They was on. That fight was happening. And here we are 20 years later. Yes, it's 20 years later, but any of you ever had a grudge? Anybody ever had hatred in their life? Come on now. I know there's more than three of you. You had hatred in your life? You know what I mean. It'll eat you up. It's a fire that you can't just not nurse because it will keep going. If you don't have some divine spirit-filled water to put it out, 
it's going to burn and burn and burn. Something happened to Esau. God took care of Esau. Who was Jacob worried about all this time? And who got fixed? Jacob, amen. That's right, brother. Jacob was playing for a... I'm going back to that prayer, y'all. He was praying for all these help concerning Esau. And he got his answer to prayer and this angel. And what got fixed? Jacob. Are you going to be Jacob? Are you going to give up the self and surrender? Are you going to go through life trying to be double-minded? Trying to have your way and follow God at the same time? Do a little bit of mixture. Mix it together like you want it. Are you going to mix your way a little bit with God's way? Does that mix? No. It's all God's way or none. His way is perfect. It goes straight down. Your way tends to do like this. No matter what you do, you're not going to be able to walk His way. Unless you surrender and just let Him lead. Amen. He says, your ways are not my ways. Or He says, my ways are not your ways. You've got to surrender for Him. And what are you going to do with that? Amen. I'm done, brother. If um, if this has affected your life tonight, I'd like for all y'all to pray I and mean, bow your heads for a minute. I don't need we don't need to be looking around at everybody else, but um, if this has affected your life tonight, if you've got a decision to make for God, it doesn't take but a moment. You can do it in your seat. You can do it up here by the altars. But choosing God's way is a personal thing. It's something that you got, it's a distinctive thing too. It doesn't happen and then you go about your life being a normal. You don't go back to being normal. You choose to do God's will and it sticks with you. Because God sticks with you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you've never trusted God, if you've never chose to invite Him into your heart, this is the time. You don't know if you're going to be guaranteed tomorrow. With this weather tonight, you don't know if you're going to get home. You need to choose God tonight. And if you're already saved and you keep finding yourself wanting to mix in your little bit of way to do things and let not follow God, or if you keep having these valleys after valleys after valleys and you don't know what to do about them and you need God's help, that's probably because you're not following Him. Because if you're, if you're finding yourself not having any hope, the hope only lies in Him. I invite you to come up tonight. Come up here to these altars. Make your decision. Make your choice known. Let God lead you in the right ways. And then stick by that commitment. Because we talk about Jacob having passion. And that passion doesn't just, it isn't just willy-nilly. He had passion to hang on. And it's going to take some commitment and some um, just energy in your life hanging on to that with all you got. God will hold on to you. There's a scripture that says, um, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. God will finish the work. And even, even I'm sorry, Christians, but you might not like this, but once you become a Christian, He's going to finish His work whether you like it or not. So you are not going to be left alone. Would your mom and daddy let you just keep going wrong? No, no, they're going to whoop you. And God's going to keep you in line. 